it's uh, I think it's ten o'clock and we've got nine o'clock. Ten o'clock somewhere. You can tell where I'm going today. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and morning. welcome to the executive committee meeting of January twelfth. Um, Happy New Year. I'd like to welcome uh, Supervisor Horn back to the fold. And uh, I'm happy to see Supervisor Roberts here. In case I mess up, he can s step in and tell me where I'm going wrong. And so uh, we really appreciate it. It's going to be a busy year, and uh, we're looking forward to moving forward. Um, our first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Uh, do we have any comments, corrections, or changes? If not, could we have a motion to approve? For approval. Mr. Morrison, second. Anybody? Second. Second. Mr. Supervisor Horn, please vote with your little clickers. Wow, that's weird. I didn't hear it click. <laughs> Keep listening. Yours is broken. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Item number two, we'll move to public comment. I have one speaker slip uh, from Ernie Martinez. Welcome. Thank you. I don't know how much I have, but I would like to let you know that well, uh, I'm standing up a cybersecurity governance apprenticeship program. Could you identify yourself and where? Uh, Ernie Martinez, my phone number is 619-405-0163. I'm located right down the street, 6th and, uh, and Market. The uh, uh, program that I'm standing up, I won't talk about it in length because I've only got three minutes, but I'll give you an analogy. Our nation is the world's strongest military, has the world's strongest military. Why? Because of the graduates from high school. A lot of them, 10% are, um, are focused, know where they're going. The other 90% are like me totally clueless of what I'm going to do after high school. This program, now getting back into the military, the military gets us clueless, uh, late bloomers, if you will, and teaches us discipline and gives us tests. They, give, they send us to tech school, they send us to C school, and then specialize in, in, a, in a career. So they, they <coughs> channel us out this way. They grow us from the ground up. That's what I want to do with the, this apprenticeship program in the workforce. I'm mirror and aligning myself with the D, uh, the Homeland Security and NIST and NICE, which is a requirement via some executive orders from the president. The, the issue is here is, is to grow these late bloomers in, in some, in parallel like the military does. We have, like I said, we have the strongest group. I think that uh, by getting, oh, by the way, the big issue with, with, with the community, defense, and everybody else is money in hiring the apprenticeship for any apprenticeship program. I've looked at it both ways. I like to, uh, the issue with regard to dollars and cents of hiring vets, disabled, and the other uh, with the employers who already have employees, they're already employed. Let's get them into the cybersecurity mindset by getting into this apprenticeship program. It's easy to do. I've been in business for 17 years as a defense contractor. So I, I hope to speak in the next one at 10 o'clock. So I think that is it in a nutshell. I just want to let you know that I'm here in San Diego, been here forever, grew up out of New Mexico, but I'm here, my office is right across the street at um, Ace Hardware at Kaplan International. I just uh, leased a, an office space there. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, and I hope to plant something here, so maybe you can ask me some questions. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. I uh, do not have any other public speakers. Uh, I'd like to move to item number three. This is a review of our draft board agenda with Victoria. Good morning. Good morning. On your January 26th draft board agenda, we have the first item, which is approval, approval of the meeting minutes, followed by public comments and um, action from policy advisory committees. Under your consent calendar, we have item four, which is approval of proposed solicitations and contracts. At this time, we don't have any specifics, but we'll have a placeholder for that. Item number five is the performance management safety targets. This is coming up through the transportation committee, and we're asking for an approval 
followed by item number six, which is the proposed 2018 SANDAG legislative program, which I'll be presenting to you today. Item number seven is the 2017 audited comprehensive annual financial report. You will also see that on this agenda. Item number eight is your standard report on meetings and events attended on behalf of SANDAG, followed by the report summarizing delegated actions taken by the executive director. Under the chair's report, we have item 10, which is an update on the 2018 SANDAG Board of Directors annual retreat for information. Under reports, item 11 is coming through the um, various PACs through RPC and TC. It's the first Transnet 10-year comprehensive program review. This is for discussion. Followed by item number 12, which is the Buena Vista Lagoon Enhancement Program. We brought this to the board a while ago, and now we're seeking to certify the final EIR. Item number 13 is the Interregional Tribal Transportation Strategy. This is coming up from the Borders Committee. Item number 14 is the proposed FY 2018 program budget amendment for um, the Interstate 5 Voight Drive improvements and for the Interstate 5 Genesee Avenue Auxiliary Lanes projects. This will fund design for both projects and split off the Voight Drive and create a new CIP so that we can closely track and monitor the funding for these projects. <coughs> Item number 15 is the Caltrans planning grants. Um, these are, these, this is coming up from the Regional Planning and Transportation Committee. We're looking for an approval. We're um, accepting uh, the awards for the FY18 Caltrans planning grants, and we're also proposing the submissions for the FY2018-2019 um, submission. Um, I, item number 16 is the proposed 2018 program budget amendment for bridge 257.2. This is coming from the Transportation Committee. We'll be accepting funding from NCTD and also splitting off this project from the El Barrera to Moreno project and making it standalone followed by item number 17, which is a closed session item on the downtown bus stopover and multi-use facility. Um, in addition to this, we would like to also add one item under the chair's report related to the SANDAG Audit Committee. Um, we, the board will be asked to approve the members of the SANDAG Audit Committee Public Member Screening Committee. So this will be in addition to what you see on your agenda today. Are there any questions or comments regarding this proposed agenda? If not, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Mr. Wells, a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second for Mr. Morrison. Any further discussion? Please vote. Okay, thank you very much. That's approved. Um, before we take item number four, uh, I'd like to uh, move up item number seven which is our audit audited comprehensive annual financial report I'd like to do that first we have Leanne Wallace and uh, Jennifer Davis Fox good morning good morning good morning chair and vice chair good morning members of the committee uh, with us today is Jennifer Farr Jennifer is a partner with the Independent Certified Big Counting Firm of Davis Carr. What did you do with the other part? <laughs> <laughs> There's a Davis. <laughs> if, if you remember, Jennifer was with us back in September, I think, to discuss the planning of the financial audit. Now they have concluded the audit, including the audit of Sandex Comprehensive and New Financial Report of the CAFR and the basic financial statements of the three component units, the San Diego County Regional Transportation Commission, Source Plain Arches, as well as the financial statements of the SR-125 tow road operations for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2017. As you know, the purpose of the financial audit is to provide reasonable assurance that Sandex financial statements are accurate, Sandex internal control over financial reporting is sound. The independent auditors of Davis Park performed various audit procedures and conducted numerous audit testings of overall financial data during the interim and year-end audit before they issued their audit opinions. So Jennifer is here today to present the results of the audit as well as communicate matters to the executive committee in accordance with the statement of audit. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. We, as Leanne mentioned, we have completed the audit for the fiscal year ended June 30, 2017. 
And in addition to the financial statement audits that we have already finalized, we will be returning this month to complete our single audit testing of the federal grant awards. We begin our preliminary audit procedures in June of 2017, and we complete the majority of the audit in October and November of 2017. There's a large audit team on your audit. It involves myself, two managers, two senior auditors, three staff auditors, and a certified information systems auditor. Together we spend over a thousand hours looking at your books and testing compliance for your agency. As Leanne mentioned, our audit includes performing extensive testing on material assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses that you see in your comprehensive annual financial report. The government auditing standards also require us to verify compliance with certain laws and regulations that we believe are material to your financial statements. So for example, those procedures include testing for compliance with the California Government Code, testing for bond compliance, grant compliance, and, com and also compliance with your internal policies such as your purchasing policy. So I'm happy to report that the results of those thousand plus audit procedures um, found that you had no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal controls and additionally, there were no material instances of non-compliance to report. I also wanted to mention that during our audit, the Department of, or the Director of Finance sends out a fraud questionnaire that we prepare. It's sent out to all of the employees of SANDAG, and it asks them to report to us directly if they have any concerns of fraud. So again, happy to report that, that we received no responses as a result of that fraud questionnaire that was sent out. <coughs> the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report was issued on December 15th of 2017. It has an unmodified audit opinion, which is the highest level of opinion that you can receive. And it means that the financial statements and the disclosures are presented in accordance with the counting standards and that they are um, consistent with the prior year. This year we had no new significant accounting standards that were implemented, but I did want to let you know that next year's a big year from an accounting standpoint. You'll be implementing a new accounting standard. It's called GASB Statement Number 75, and it is, the purpose of it is to record the unfunded portion of OPEB, or other post-employment benefits. It's similar to the pension standard, where you put the pension liability on the financial statements a few years back. But because SANDAG has funded the OPEB liability over time, you should find that the impact to your financial statements will not be significant or as significant as it would be to other government agencies. So lastly, I wanted to thank SANDAG staff for all of their efforts. You can imagine in the time it takes us to audit the records, how much time it takes them to prepare those records and um, deal with all of our questions and requests. We found that the finance department was prepared for the audit and the accounting records had been maintained accurately. So this include, concludes my prepared comments and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the audit or the financial statements themselves. <coughs> Go ahead. <laughs> On the um, fraud surveys that you sent out to the employees, uh, I think I know the answer to this question, but um, are those returned um, with anonymity, or does everybody have to be identified? Uh, we There's nothing on the fraud questionnaire that says that um, there will be anonymity. It's hard work to say. <laughs> um, so that, that is not a promise that's made to the employees, no. Uh, no the reason why I ask that question is because um, my, my thought is that you may not get employees that will actually respond if there, is, if there are uh, questions because they might be afraid of losing a job. Mm -hmm. So how, how, is that, how are they protected, I guess, from that kind of... Scenario. Well, the, the purpose of the audit is not to detect fraud. It is something that um, management here has thought was a good procedure to extend 
the audit requirements to ask a small group of people about fraud and extend it out to, to everybody. Um, the best way to get that type of information would be an internal program to have a fraud hotline or some other process where there would be a monitoring of the fraud hotline to, to ensure that the employees was protected. Okay, I, I just, I guess I don't see the, the reason for doing it if that's not a way to disclose fraud or the suspected fraud type thing. I don't know, it just, it could just say it, but it sounds to me like window okay. dressing. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. A couple of things, kind of looking for, as we set up, as this board sets up, it's an internal it's audit committee, I think, and hires its own independent performance auditor, I think, something like the fraud hotline is something that has, that's what they think a lot about. So I think moving forward, there's that. With regard to the fraud survey, it doesn't come to me, it doesn't come, I don't think it would come and we really direct any, if, yeah, while it's maybe not anonymous, we don't, it doesn't come through sort of management at Sanday. Any issues raised goes directly to um, our outside um, firm. So while I understand that it's not, you know, necessarily promise of being anonymous, <laughs> I'm not going to try to say the word this morning. It, it doesn't, it doesn't come to management. So I think that sort of mitigates it a, a little bit, but looking forward to that. I'm just pointing that out because I think if we're asking those questions, mm -hmm. people need to feel uh, secure in the fact that if right. I point something out, I'm not going to lose my job. Right. Right. Good yeah. point. Customer that? Kim, it um, covered a little bit, but at the uh, city of San Diego, <coughs> we have, um, you know, they do the outside audit of the financials, the capper, and um, but our um, auditor at Eduardo Luna, we have a whole audit department. Mm -hmm. All the fraud, the hotline, all of that goes to our internal. So once we have that performance auditor on board, um, <clears throat> we have a, a great process at the city. So, you know, um, always, I'm sure Eduardo would be happy. You need, you need a, a copy or, or yeah. use. Okay. Good. Any other uh, questions for our auditors? <coughs> Clarifications or anything? This is an item for information. Uh, but we want to give everybody an opportunity to ask questions or uh, clarify things. We really appreciate the work that you've done and uh, happy that everything is coming out the way it should. Thank you, Chief. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay, I'd like to then move to um, item number four um, with Julie. This is a uh, Kind of an intense item because it goes through all the details that we need to change in our policies uh, to reflect uh, the new legislation and, and get ourselves ready for moving forward. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Julie. So good morning. Um, <coughs> I um, came to you a couple months ago and told you about the tasks we were working on to implement 8805. And one of those tasks was um, making changes to our board policies and bylaws um, to make sure we're consistent um, with the requirements that are in 8805. Um, most of the policy changes that I'm going to go through with you today are due to 8805. However, there are some changes that are not mandatory due to 805. Um, but are just a good idea in our minds. Um, for, so I'll point those out when it's not a mandatory provision. There's also a few changes that staff has requested as part of their normal annual review of floor policies and bylaws, and I'll point those out as well. So to save time, my plan here is not to necessarily hit on every single change, especially when a change is made in more than one place on the same substance. Um, so. What I'll do is I'll be moving through the policies, but if you see me skipping things, um, it's either because it's not substantive or it's because I've already covered that change with you in another spot of the policies and bylaws. By all means, if you have questions, um, though, I'll stop at the end of each policy, and you're welcome to ask about any change you see um, within them. So I'm going to start with the bylaws. Um, so if everyone will go, um, if you want to follow along, um, you can go to page six 
um, uh, attachment one, or you can follow along on your iPads um, and start on page 20. So um, you'll see there that starts the bylaws. None of the changes on that first page are substantive, so I'm moving on to page 7 or 21 on your iPads, starting with section 3 on that page. Um, this is um, the change to change you from five um, standing policy advisory committees to six, and it adds the audit committee um, down in subsection D of that of three. Um, and then if you move on to the next page, page eight, um, this is article three, section three F that I'm going to cover with you. Um, there used to be language in here that, in the bylaws that talked about how um, it wasn't um, a good idea to have the chair and the vice chair from the same subregion, but it wasn't prohibited, so there were various provisions in here that allowed for what you do in that situation. Now AB 805 prohibits the chair and the vice chair coming from the same subregion. So every time there was mention of what to do if they're from the same subregion, that's been stricken out. Um, Moving on to um, section 5C, lower on the page. This is a bit of a decision point for um, you all as far as your recommendation to the board. Um, you'll see that it says that um, board members and alternates of the policy advisory committees get $100 per meeting. Um, now you're gonna have both board members and members of the public on your new audit committee. So the question is, do you want compensation to go to the public members sitting on the audit committee? Um, I will tell you that normally it is only board members that are paid. So for example, on the Public Safety Committee, we have law enforcement officials and board members. The law enforcement officials do not, do not get paid. Also, um, another example is the ITOC, the Independent Taxpayer Oversight Committee. Those members don't get paid. But I do want to point out we'd have to make a, a change to this to make it clear that the public members um, wouldn't get paid, um, and one way or the other, I'm just looking for feedback. So when I get through with the bylaws, I'll, I'll ask you for that. So moving on to the next page, um, under um, Article 4, Section 3, um, so we're on page 9 um, on hard copies and 23 on iPads. Um, you'll see about halfway down through that section, it talks about audit committee holding closed sessions. So um, the board in the past in this bylaws has only allowed the transportation committee and the executive committee to hold closed sessions. The thought here is that um, you may have situations where your audit committee might want to meet in closed session to deal with personnel issues with the independent performance auditor or to deal with investigatory issues. Maybe they're going to need legal counsel assistance. And so the idea here is to allow um, for the audit committee to also hold closed sessions on issues within their purview, but this is not a mandatory change under AP 805. On the next page, uh, page 10 or 24 on the iPads, you'll see a lot of red. There are a lot of changes here. Um, I'll go over what those are. Um, first of all, um, in section 5, you've got changes um, to make it clear that the tally vote will be the first type of vote that's taken in all cases except when voting um, for an officer. Um, the officer votes will be done weighted vote first, um, if, with the exception of another issue I'll bring up later on. Um, but the typical way of voting at Sandag um, from now on is tally vote only. Um, if requested, a weighted vote can be brought. Um, it would require um, four members um, from different uh, member agencies and um, a vote of not less than 51% in order to supersede the prior tally vote if the weighted vote is called for. Um, one exception that we want to note that this, um, it, and you'll see some language that says, unless otherwise required by law, um, we do want to point out to you that there are some statutes that would not allow for a weighted vote. So for example, um, when you're making a decision on a resolution of necessity for eminent domain purposes, the statute specifically requires two-thirds of your members um, vote, so a weighted vote couldn't be used in that type of scenario. Um, but otherwise, you'll be using the tally vote unless the weighted vote method is called for. Um, speaking back um, on subsection B to the issue I, I uh, mentioned before, um, you had in your bylaws before, um, uh, when you had both weighted and tally vote required, 
scenarios with, that could have come up where you, for example, are voting on officers um, with the weighted vote and you've got more than one candidate, potentially, and you may keep voting and never be able to reach your 51% because your votes are split too many directions. So um, what we're proposing as staff is that you keep the provision with some slight modification to allow you to use tally vote on the preliminary votes for the chair and vice chair votes, but then you use a weighted vote when you got it, got, got it down to um, your final vote. Um, so that's what's in subsection B. Um, let's see. Um, so then um, you'll see crossed out in the former subsection B where it says the city and county of San Diego shall determine how to allocate their single agency vote. So um, 8805 took that out. So the county and city of San Diego no longer have discretion on how to allocate um, their weighted vote. It is to be split down the middle. And the main um, sort of result of that is that before when the county and the city only had one member present because somebody else left, they were allowed to shift 100% of their vote to the other supervisor or the other council member who might be there in the, in the BC um, and, or, and wasn't there because you only had one there. Now you wouldn't be allowed to do that anymore. The city and the county would lose 50% of their weighting, weight, weighted vote power if one of their members wasn't present. That makes sense. Everybody makes sense. So anyway, that's why that language is stricken. Um, let me see. Then down in subsection B, um, what this is is a discussion of how the weighted vote occurs. Um, and um, one of the issues that we ran into um, is that since AB 805 says that four separate member agencies need to vote in favor to supersede um, the, pr the prior vote, um, we needed to um, make sure that we had a way to track those four separate agencies. Now, since the city of San Diego and the county of San Diego each have two tally votes, the way we decided we would track that, um, and what we're proposing to you is that um, whoever controls the tally vote at the time of vote would, all, um, would control whether the four agency vote would count. So to give you an example, um, let's say the county has um, two people there for their A and B seat, a weighted vote is called, the A voter votes in favor, um, so their 50% of their votes goes in favor, the B voter goes the other way, so their 50% goes the other way. Who gets to decide among the two of them whether the four member agency requirement is met since the two went the opposite direction? And, and, what, we're, and what the bylaws would say is whoever was in control of the tally vote at the time is who controls whether the four agency minimum is met. Okay? I'm sorry, this is sort of confusing. So it doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay. It's whatever your county or city has designated by resolution. Um, oh, okay. So the city council um, and the county have sent SANDAG their, all their members and indicated an order of priority who would hold the tally vote depending upon who's present. Okay? Okay. Um, so um, the remaining changes in Article 4 are all just required um, for consistency with AB 805. Um, so if you go to the, the next page, you'll see all the changes of the number of votes. Um, this is all just AB 805 changes. So there's no um, discretion on whether to approve these changes or not. Frank, so um, with that, I'm going to move to um, page 13, um, which is page 27 on your iPads. Um, and you'll see at the top of the page under section 3, it says um, that the election will occur every two years. Um, that's changed from one year. That's an 8805 requirement. Um, what we did, though, is down in subsection A, underneath there, you'll see it, that the election will occur in and around July of the, um, an election year. Um, here we're proposing that you align your election year cycles um, with uh, in, internal to SANDAG with the election year cycles that occur external to SANDAG. So in other words, your city council and county supervisor voting um, process. So that's what that change is about. Um, the rest of these changes um, on this page are um, not something I'm going to discuss. They're either non-substantive or redundant. Um, so that moves us to the next page. Um, and so we're on Article 5, Section 3, um, page 14, um, or page 28 of your iPads. Um, 
And actually, I'm going to skip down to section four. Apologize for that. So section four there, um, you'll see um, a change regarding uh, um, the bond language. So right now, um, your bylaws will be require the executive director um, to have a public official bond. The proposal here is that if you end up hiring an independent performance auditor as an employee versus um, as a firm or an outside consultant, um, that you would also allow for the um, independent performance auditor to have a public official bond. Um, so there's no more substantive changes to the bylaws um, that I haven't already discussed. So at this point, I'm going to pause to see if there are questions. Any questions? Pause to see if there are questions. Any questions regarding the uh, proposed bylaw changes? I just wanted a clarification on the um, you know, tally versus weighting, weighted vote on an eminent domain. So an eminent <laughs> taking um, uh, of property, that would have to be a two-thirds tally vote. The weighted vote doesn't count in the eminent domain. Yeah, you would just stick with your tally vote and not call for a weighted vote in that style. Okay. That's clear. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Well, I do have some uh, concerns uh, about this. My staff uh, noticed with Sandak's interpretation um, of 805, for instance, uh, on item two, the staff report highlighted text states that in one of the city's members is absent, then, like, like you said, the voting power will be diminished by half. Section 5C on page 10 of staff report uh, interprets how a weighted vote can be called. I would like to uh, have count, uh, Sandak Council and my, our city attorney in my office discuss uh, this because she, they were interested in how this was interpreted. If you don't mind, uh, before it to uh, goes to the full board, that's my concern. And then um, you know, have that discussion before it goes to the board. Yes, sir. Okay. If that's possible. Thank you. <coughs> Anything else? Uh, that basically is it. I expect these to be resolved. But I just want to, sure. to talk about it, discuss it more. Thank you. Other comments on the on the changes? Okay, let's go to. Okay, okay board policy one. Um, so um, this is um, now you're on page um, 19 of your um, packet. And um, this um, policy basically lays out the various um, the board responsibilities and the policy advisory committee responsibilities. Um, so starting there on section 2.5, um, what has happened is the um, staff has requested that we clarify here that when um, the board is asked to certify or adopt environmental documents, um, that they could do so both under the National Environmental Policy Act and the California Environmental Quality Act. So clarify that it applies for both NEPA, NEPA and SUPA documents. Um, the next page, um, if you flip to that, page 20, um, which is page 34 on the iPads, um, sections 2.14 and 2.15. Um, 2.14 is added um, due to AB 805. Um, which calls for the board um, to have a monitoring process for um, looking at how um, staff performance evaluations are conducted at SANDAG. And so um, this change is proposed to um, accomplish that. And then the next one down, 2.15, um, talks about um, the new report AB 805 requires that's developed by the Transportation Committee but submitted to the legislature by the board um, concerning um, transit, various transit matters. Um, so this language is basically cut and pasted from AB 805. Um, sections 2.16 through section 2.20 all deal with the auditor, um, the audits and the independent um, uh, performance auditor, and they're all consistent with language that you've already approved um, or the board's approved as part of board policy 39. Um, down under section three, executive committee membership, there are no changes proposed for the executive committee's um, areas of responsibility. So that puts us down to the bottom of page 21, or 35 on your iPads, um, section 4, which deals with transportation committee members and their responsibilities. You'll see the change here, changing um, the number of voters from 9 to 10. Um, and on the next page, that is intended to add the report um, as required by 8805. Um, section 4.14. Um, is um, a, a staff request for an update. Um, there was some confusion about exactly what the Transportation Committee could do with regard to not only 
um, approving or making um, recommendations regarding SANDAG's grant programs, but when the SANDAG itself is applying for grants for its transportation projects. So to clarify that, the language in 4.14 says that the TC on um, the Transportation Committee can approve of SANDAG submitting grant applications for SANDAG transportation projects. And then if you go to the next page under 4.1.23, it says that um, you, the Transportation Committee can provide input on project selection criteria and recommended projects for funding under both the statewide and transnet active transportation programs and other transnet grant programs. So that's just a clarification. Um, and let's see, the last one on that is just, again, regarding that report that goes to the legislature. So it's a repeat. Um, and then um, lastly, for the Transportation Committee, on the following page, page 24, section 5.15, um, clarifying that not only can um, Transportation Committee approve distribution of funds from the Coastal Commission's Beach Sand Mitigation Fund, but also from its Public Recreational um, Beach Impact Mitigation Fund. No changes are proposed for the Borders Committee. Um, that, and we go down to section... That, that was regional planning. Oh, sorry. No other plan changes for regional planning under other than the one um, with the Coastal Commission um, Recreational Beach Fund. Um, so no changes for Borders Committee in Section 6. Section 7, um, this is just a cross-reference to the new Board Policy 39 for the Audit Committee um, members and responsibilities. So there's no other changes to this policy. I'll pause here if there are questions. Mm -hmm. Rob? There are questions. Question on, on page 20, and uh, Jimmy, I don't have my glasses with me, but uh, I believe that is uh, 2.19, where it, uh, it, it approves either the individual or the firm to be able to hire to carry out their duties. Is any caveat should be there within their purview, because since they're independent, I want to make sure that they are, if they're not obligating us for something we have not budgeted. Oh, yeah, there's already um, protections for that within Board Policy 39. Okay, okay. Um, I'll make sure. Requires make sure we're covered. The budget. Okay, yes. thank you. Good. Other questions? Comments? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to skip to Board Policy 2. That's page 26 or page 40 on your iPads. This is the Policy Advisory Committee um, policy. Um, and a lot of these changes we've already um, gone over from um, the other um, Board Policy 1 and the bylaws. You we'll note um, Section um, 1.5 now adds the Audit Committee with the five voting members. Um, so then the next change I'll go over with you is on the following page, page 27. Um, there's a title change there, just to make it clear that the appointment process for the Audit Committee is different than it is for the other Policy Advisory Committees. Um, and oh, also up on Section 2, a limitation on committee membership. It used to be that um, it, it was a limitation. You could only serve on two Policy Advisory Committees as a board member. Um, AB 805 specifically allows for um, membership on the Audit Committee as an exception to the two limit, two, um, committee limit. So that's what that change is intended to accomplish. Um, so that um, does it for changes to board policy two. Uh, any questions on board policy two? Questions, comments? Okay, seeing none. Okay, so now we're gonna skip to board policy 10, page 31 or page 45 on your iPads. Um, this is um, concerning ballot measures. So, um, board uh, 8805 doesn't discuss this, so this is a discretionary change. But um, looking at the changes that were made for MTS and NCTE on putting measures on the ballot, um, and looking at this board policy, which um, previously or currently only allows for you to take position on statewide or countywide ballot measures, it's possible that MTS or NCTE will place measures on um, a, a city or multiple city ballots versus a county-wide ballot. Um, and so we're proposing a change here to allow you to take a position on an MTS or NCT measure, no matter what type of ballot um, it appears on. Um, and that's the only change to this policy. So, anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Okay, um, so now we're gonna skip to page 30. Um, 30, page 32, that's not right. 
page, uh, let's see, the next board policy. Wait, wait a minute, we go back there just for a moment on that one you were just talking about with the uh, MPS or uh, North County Transit. <clears throat> now, as I understand it though, it's only if it's placed on there by MT, uh, it by these two different groups. Right. But if someone puts like an initiative for a special election that involves MTS or that that's not placed by them, then we would not be, since that would not be a county-wide or necessarily or a statewide, we would not be able to take a position. Is that how it reads? Yeah, as the language is currently drafted, but we can change that. Yeah, that's something I'm thinking about. In other words, if, if some group brought up a proposition for MTS and put it on a special election, shall we say, and it would only involve the MTS area or the North County Transit area, then since that is not being placed by MTS or North County Transit, then we would not be allowed to take a position <coughs> as I read this. Yes, that's the way. I, I'm, I apologize okay. for not <coughs> contemplating that scenario, but you're right. So. But, but the intent, uh, at least the thinking was, to allow Sanday to have the flexibility of taking positions on the sim similar kind of Correct. Place. Yeah, but that's not what state. Yeah, yeah. Would you okay. like us to change? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would think that we, we would want to contemplate that, especially in this day of citizens' initiatives and everything. Uh, <coughs> Do I see nods generally? Yes. Okay. If you're looking for something that would say placed by or regarding something on that last one, that would be a little okay. bit language. Okay. okay. So um, that brings us to the next page, um, Board Policy 16, um, Attachment 5. Um, this is on page 32 or um, page uh, 46 on your iPads. Um, so the next three policies are Board Policy 16, 23, and 24. These all are procurement policies. Board Policy 16 deals with services, 23 is equipment and supplies and 24 is construction. Um, so these changes um, occur in multiple policies. So I'm gonna go over them only the first time they occur in a policy so that you can um, see the nature of them. So with that in mind, we'll um, go to page 37, or 51 on your iPads, section 6.6. .6. Um, and what you'll see here is um, the change um, that um, is required by 805 um, that we have adequate audit provisions to allow the independent performance auditor um, to access the contracted and uh, anybody we contract with records. Um, so one of the issues that came up when this was discussed a couple months ago um, with the full board was this issue of whether we should go back and amend our existing contracts to strengthen those to add reference um, specifically to the independent performance auditor. We are asked to look at what that might cost to do that um, and whether it seemed like a good idea to do so. So we did look into that and basically what we determined, um, as you'll see in your reports, is it would cost us around um, $46,000. Um, to go back and amend existing contracts. There are over 100 of them that are live contracts right now. Um, what we did do also is talk to your current principal internal auditor who already uses the um, audit provisions in our contracts as they exist now to do um, performance audits and asked whether he had any issues with gathering documents using our existing language and uh, we were told no. Um, that the existing language has worked fine for getting all the records we need to do an audit. So what staff is proposing is that we do um, go ahead and amend the template language so that it specifically refers to the independent performance audit in the future, but that that is not necessary to go back and amend all the old contracts to add that language. Um, so that's what that particular change in 6.6 .6 is about. Um, so now we can um, skip to page 43. Um, which is uh, page 57 on the iPads um, and um, a section 11.6. Um, this is a change that we're making at staff's request. Um, when this policy was originally adopted, um, we, had, um, we did not have our own labor compliance policies and practices, and so we had a reference here to Caltrans um, Labor Compliance Handbook. Um, since that time, we've come up with our own written policies and practices for labor compliance, so we'd like to just refer to our own and take out the reference to Caltrans. Um, 
Then we um, can move to page um, 24, or excuse me, for policy 24, um, on page 59. Um, this is the equipment and supplies, so it's 59 on your hard copies and 73 um, on your um, iPads. And um, what you'll see here is um, starting in section 2.1.6. Um, this is a change <coughs> mandated by um, AB 805 um, to require that when we co do construction contracts in excess of $1 million that we use a skilled and trained workforce um, and also refers to the um, public utility code sections that um, allow for exceptions to that. Um, and, and this language is basically, again, cut and pasted from AB 805's language. Um, the rest of the changes in this policy are changes I've already um, discussed with you and the changes that were in, in board policy um, 23 um, are also changes I've already discussed with you. Um, so now this brings us to the last issue, um, unless you have questions on the changes to board policies 22, 23, or 24, I'll move on to the budget request. I'm just curious, have we not been using the skilled and trained workforce to build all our projects already? Um, oh, we believe we have been using a skilled and trained workforce to use our projects, but we haven't been tracking the percentage of folks that are coming out of um, the state's approved apprenticeship programs. Um, and what we've done is we've allowed them to either have on-the-job training or come out of one of those state-approved programs. What this skilled and trained um, labor requirement does is require that a higher percentage of them come out of those approved apprentice programs versus on the job training. Okay. So are all of those approved um, labor unions? Um, I believe most of them are in the San Diego region, yes. So that displaces anybody who was skilled and trained but not a labor union? No. 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 The, the apprenticeship programs are run those by, by unions, by labor, and there are also programs that are run by ABC, for example. They have a fairly Thank large. Thank you. Yeah, they have a fairly large. Um, I'm just wondering why. I mean, if if, if uh, just wondering if it, we had not been using skilled and trained workers in the past. That's all. Thank you. Other comments. Okay, so this moves us to the budget item. So the last attachment. Um, to this report um, is a budget um, request and it concerns um, the new um, work element that we've set up, um, 8102. Um, as I've told the board before, um, the reason we've set up a new um, element number is so that we can track the costs associated with AD 5 implementation in case we want to make a state mandates claim. Um, in November, the board approved use of contingency reserves in the amount of $50,000 to get us up and rolling on making changes. Um, we've now gone through and looked at the number of staff hours we think that we needed for the rest of fiscal year 18 um, to make all the changes. We've come up with a staff hours amount that's um, approximately 1,700 hours of time um, and um, some additional uh, needs with regard to consulting hours. Um, and so that's what's shown in attachment eight. And based on um, working with our finance department, we are able to move around other um, staff support um, uh, items under the 8,100 series of work element to cover the staff hours. However, we don't have enough to cover all the consultant needs. Um, and so we're asking for another um, 40, sorry. 42,600. 42,600, thank you in um, contingency reserves, this would still leave you with um, more than a 13% balance, um, which is a consistent use with um, your board policy 30. Um, so with all of that in mind, um, with the recommendation um, today is um, that you're asked to um, discuss the proposed amendments to board policies and bylaws and either recommend that the board of directors approve the proposed amendments or direct them to return to the executive committee next month for further discussion or review. Um, and then approve the use of up to $42,600 a contingency reserve for Assembly Bill 805 implementation expenses. And we have one modification in, in that we would not be bringing this forward to the board until we uh, have the clarification with uh, 
in the city, city staff. Yes. And they changed to board policy tech. Can I, so one thing that was outstanding is do you want to pay the public members? The let's get staff? let's get one and two done and then we'll see if there's any comment on. I'm sorry. Um, let's let's consider one and two, which is the issue of the bylaws and the money, and then we'll get comment on uh, whether we compensation of the clothing. Uh, is there any further comments or discussion on this on these two items? I just had a question. I heard <clears throat> if we make a state mandate claim, are we going to be making a state mandate claim for these dollars? I think we want to be prepared in case uh, the board wants to do that. I think that should be offered to the board yes. for that um, discussion or, or make it an agenda. Okay. Is that, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. We have six million dollars for the budget. Okay, could, uh, any further discussion? Is there any uh, motion to, to move this forward? Yes, I'll move. Get it okay. Supervisor Horn, is there a second? Second. Second from uh, Mayor Morrison. Any further discussion? And this is on I, on the on the uh, budget and the bylaw changes. And board policy. And board policy. Any further discussion? Would you please vote? Okay, thank you very much. The last tail, uh, last item that we wanted to get a little bit of a feedback from is regarding uh, the compensation for the outside uh, members of the committee. Is that correct? Yes. Any thoughts on that matter? <clears throat> we're basically saying we're not, we're currently not paying outside folks in our other committees, but we could make an exception. First, I think it should be board members only. I think once you break that, it's, it's, it starts snowballing. Okay. That I'm going to ask you a question. The other committees where we are not paying outside mm -hmm. members, do they have those outside members who are not being paid, do they actually have a vote on their committees? Yes. Okay. So this is this, not paying would be consistent yes. with what we've done. Okay. Correct. Yes. So I'm seeing nods that we would rather be consistent and continue the process. Is that correct? Okay, that's the feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for all the work. And I know this is uh, a little tedious because it's a lot of detail, but one of the strengths of SANDAG, I think, is the policies that we put in place, and it really helps us uh, on, a, on a yearly basis to make, make decisions. So it's, it's well worth doing. Okay, we are, we are running out of uh, time, but there's one item that I think I'd like to uh, have the executive committee hear about, and that is the proposed um, board retreat uh, agenda. So we'll go through this very quickly, but we want to give you a flavor of what we're thinking about for the retreat at Verona. Uh, a lot of work has been put into this, and we want to get your feedback. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm David Hicks, your Communications Director. This is Trudy Sop, uh, the founder of Center for Organization Effectiveness. And we're going to go over the retreat. It's actually a really fun and interesting one this year. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit different than it has been in the past. Um, and uh, just real quickly, the purpose of the retreat is threefold. One is to orient new members. That means um, um, get them uh, situated on the basics of SANDEG and, and also that perspective, that regional perspective. Second is to get you all and the board a way to build relationships, really to build working relationships, a way where you have some time to talk to each other. And third is to look at big picture issues coming up in the next year and beyond that um, at, from a strategic perspective. And uh, getting at that last one is what we're really going to spend some extra time doing this year by um, building more time into the retreat for actual board discussion. It's something we haven't been doing without feedback we've gotten is that we really haven't had enough time for the board to talk to each other. And that's our main reason for adding Trudy to the team here, is to try to help guide those discussions as you guys go through the, go through the retreat. So with that, I'm going to go through real quickly, obviously, the, the, the agenda. And I can answer questions at the end if you'd like. Um, it's, it's, um, this year it's at Perona, the same place that it was at, been at for the last several years. It starts on Wednesday afternoon, February 7th, and it goes through Friday morning, February 9th. And the first day is all about that orientation aspect. So, but we're going to take a little deeper dive into it this year, which is we're going to start with our with our, our standard orientation, which is 
getting people, new members and, and, and new B-ish members used to the voting system, how the budget works, what Sunday's responsibilities are, just the general orientation. Then we're going to ask board members to step up veterans and talk a, a little bit about some of the big challenging issues that people are going to face this coming year, the board's going to have to face. I won't go through those now because of time. And then after that, we'll, we'll, we'll break out the board into small groups, sit down with staff members, experts on, on fundamentally the fundamental work that Sandag does, allow them to ask questions. But we're going to do it in a form like sort of a speed briefing format where you go 15 minutes from one table to the, to the next, to the next, to the next, to get some basics on, um, on what the basic work that Sandag does. And the gist is to try to get through that orientation process where a new, a new or newish member walks in on Thursday morning for the more substantive conversations and feels like they know what they're talking about. They have a good sense of what Sandag does and what the major issues are coming up. So um, the dinner speaker that night is Mike Madrid. He's um, from Grassroots Lab, kind of a, an interesting expert on demographics. So day two is really about uh, drawing out that board discussion. Uh, again, why we added to the, to the team. So there's a couple panel discussions in day two, but we're going to keep the panelists a little bit shorter and, and expand, the, um, expand the, the, the interaction between the board and, and those panels. So the first panel discussion we're really excited about is uh, all three executive directors from the other big, th uh, the, you know, the last three of the big four MPOs are going to come and sit on a panel and talk about just the keys to successful regionalism. After that, we'll then tackle an issue that you guys are going to face this next year, which is um, deciding on a um, on the, on the core transportation network for the regional plant, kind of how do we go about that process of doing that? What do we want to study? And how, what's the process to getting to the end to the end game on that? After that is another panel discussion on communications and transparency. Um, where we'll have um, uh, Matt Hall from the Union Tribune's editorial board, um, Haney Hong, who's waited on from the a CEO from the Taxpayers Association, who's weighed in a lot about, about our communications. <coughs> and then Colin Parent, the new exec director of Circulate San Diego kind of from that more the stakeholder perspective. Um, then there's lunch, and we'll have a video on, um, on our milestones from the last year. Um, and then that afternoon, <laughs> fundamentally that afternoon, is for facilitated discussions on a couple of big issues um, without formal presentations. We'll dedicate the time to two big issues. One is funding needs for the implementation of the regional plan. And the other is just to sort of gather up the whole day and focus on the keys to finding common ground and moving forward together as a board. Kind of back to that where we started. What are the keys to, to successful regionalism in San Diego County? So uh, Steve Breen, the uh, editorial cartoonist for the Union Dream, he's going to be the dinner speaker that night. And he's funny and interesting, so you like him. Um, final day is just a couple of sessions. Starts with this exec committee meeting. And then we'll have, everyone gets a chance to have a ride in an autonomous vehicle that uh, Paul Combs is going to bring. And they'll also be there to answer questions and talk about what's needed locally um, to, to deploy those vehicles on the actual roads in San Diego. And then lastly, uh, your exec recruiter will come in and sum up all the, um, all the public outreach. We're really doing a lot of public outreach this month, they are. And then they'll, they'll, be, they'll have a package for you. Um, to explain what public outreach has, what, what the feedback they've gotten, and then they'll ask you basically to finalize the position description so that it can be posted and they can move forward with the process of actually recruiting your new exec director. <coughs> so uh, that should, and that's the last session of the treatment, it should end about 11 a.m. on Friday morning. And uh, you all should have gotten already an email um, asking you to register, so just click on that email, and you get a reminder in another week or so. Click on that and go through the process of registering. And uh, with that, we're here for questions. The dates again? Thank you. Um, okay, um, and welcome, Trudy. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to you helping us through it. And if there's any feedback uh, that you have or concerns, please uh, uh, let us know because we're still tweaking the agenda. And uh, we wanted to uh, provide a lot of uh, time for the board to provide input on a lot of these issues. Uh, so, uh, Sam, did you have having, having worked with Trudy for six years, she has helped us uh, uh, focus on strategic planning for the city of Escondido. And it's a pleasure to have Trudy. It's a pleasant surprise to see her this morning. She will keep us focused on Sandag. I can tell you that. Good. We so. need it. Um, 
Okay, uh, because of time, we're going to hold the other issues off to uh, the next meeting. Uh, our next executive committee meeting will be at Verona uh, on that Friday at 10. So let's uh, adjourn the meeting.